Ahmed Diallo sends Old Trafford into a 121st minute frenzy as Manchester United dispatch Liverpool en route to an FA Cup semi-final. We're dissecting that game and performances, looking ahead to a meeting with the Sky Blues and answering your questions on the FA Cup semi-finalist supporting Stradicast. Oh yeah! Swing in by Simicast, touched by McTominay. Elliot robbed. Here's Garnacho. Ahmad, who stole the ball, gets it back from Garnacho. But the young man, can he make himself a hero? He has done. It's Manchester United's quarter final. In classic Manchester United fashion, the counter attack. And a youngster doing it as well. The Busby Babes, the Fergie fledglings. And now Ten Hag has sent on Ahmad Diallo, who's hardly had a chance at Manchester United, hardly had a chance. He has scored a, a goal before for the club, but this one will go down in history. What a day. Eric Ten Hag's Manchester United have earned a place in the FA Cup semi-final following a dramatic 4-3 quarter-final victory over Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool. In a game that saw United take the lead after 10 minutes and then equalise with two minutes of regulation time to play. And then again in extra time before Ama Diallo took his moment on the greatest stage of all to set Old Trafford into complete delirium. This was a monumental moment for Ten Hag's side and a performance to go along with a result that now I think has the opportunity to galvanise this group ahead of a titanic end to what has been an otherwise underwhelming campaign. Now, with a passage towards a favourable semi-final fixture secured, I think it's worthwhile noting here, lads, that United have now eliminated Liverpool from the FA Cup 11 times. And we have not eliminated any other side more. So just how important was this result for Ten Hag and his group of players? Huge. Um, spoke to a few people before again about this because I was of the opinion he needed a win going from this game, like desperately needed a win for something to to hold on to come the end of the season because it was going to be always going to be such a big result if we could pull it off, and we did. But Ten Hag now, you know, we have a very, you know, a semi final that we should be winning. That means then, if we granted we get to the final, that's back to back seasons we've reached the FA Cup final, likely to be playing City again if if we do that. And that's always going to be a big ask. But Ten Hag now, we can say, in what has been a, a very challenging season due to injuries, um, we're getting that second half of the season that we asked for. Because what I was fearing yesterday when we conceded the two goals after being ahead for a bit, and we went in a halftime 2-1 down, was it was just a repeat, really, of what we've seen all season. You know, we get to a position where we're, Oh, it's all going well, we start so well. And then we just fuck up in the space of three or four minutes and can see two goals and the game has turned on its head. It just felt like a, a constant repeat of that. And I was thinking at half time, do you know what? We've put this down to injuries all season. And if we were to do that again and by fucking up yesterday and throwing away that lead and getting knocked out of the cup, I do think that would have been unacceptable because whether it's unacceptable from the manager or players, I, I'm not certain. But what I'd be looking at and saying is, you fuckers haven't turned up at all this season. Every time that you've that questions have been asked of you, you've you know mentally shown weaknesses, you know, thrown away two goals leads and such quick succession and sloppy goals. It's just not good enough. So what we can take from yesterday is how the players stood up. Finally, in a big game where it really mattered. And got the result that not only we desired, I think it was the result that we deserved. One thing we've been looking at week in, week out is the amount of shots that we're conceding, the amount of shots that we're allowing. And while that still went up into the 20s, this was the definition of an old school Manchester United performance where we went toe for toe with a really, really good attacking outfit. And we actually created more opportunities on goal than they did. I know a lot of people can point to it and a lot of will say the anti-United people out there will say it's at Old Trafford. You shouldn't be in a position whereby you're not creating more. But if you look at the season as a whole, you look at the performances that are there. 
I think it's a very, very notable attribute that this side were able to go out there and to really, really go hammer and tong against a side that are known for their attacking attributes and to outdo them in that. So it was totally credible. And Brian, Scott McTominay opened the scoring. He also supplied an assist for Marcus Rashford before winning the defensive header from a Liverpool corner that set the wheels in motion for that memorable goal. Now, we usually integrate questions into the end, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge one of them in here because it wasn't more so a question. And while there are obvious flaws to the Scots game, Aaron B on Twitter is crying out for a Brian-infused analysis of Scotland's Player of the Year. Just how important is Scott McTominay to this squad with what he brings? One of the things I've spoken about a lot lately is that the drop-off in quality when, we, when we're struggling with injuries, which we have done so hard all season, and suspensions and whatever else. You, you, like People forget it's a squad game. You play so many games over a season these days. Your squad is as important as your strongest eleven. You need people to come in off the bench or come in and rotate into the side. Look, everyone knows, or anyone who knows me knows I, I love Scott McTominay. I love the kind of player he is. I love the character he, he is. Um, I just I just can't understand why people don't get it. Like he's a fellow who'll come in and do a job for you. He knows himself he's not he's not Sedan or he's not Iniesta or whatever. He's not Roy Keane, Paul Scholes, he never will be. He's not that level. But he's a fellow who can come in and do a damn fine job. And I mean, this season I don't know if he's still our top scorer, but he was for quite a while. He scored some very important goals for us. Offers us a little bit of a different dynamic at times in he, when he's allowed to go forward. Um, he's just, he's a great lad. Like, listen to these interviews. He's hes one of the lads that comes out after games, even when things are tough. He, he'll come out and he'll talk and he'll answer the hard questions, but he talks so well and he handles tough situations really well. And he just... He typifies a fellow who just loves being a Manchester United player. He, we always talk about fellows who get it. Scott McDonald gets it. In spades, he gets it. I'm not going to claim he's better than he is because he is what he is. But he's the kind of fella, and we need more of that. We need the kind of fellows to come in and do a job when our main fellas are, are um, when our main fellas are injured or our strongest level are struggling with injuries and suspensions. You need lads to come in and do a job for you. And he's one that can do that. And they're the kind of players that you need to build on for a full season. And we don't have enough of that kind of guy to come in off the, off the bench or um, as squad players to come in and do a job. He's um, he's a good player. He's he's limited, granted, in his, we call it his main abilities or his world-class talents or whatever. He doesn't have that level in him. But he's a damn solid player who does a damn fine job when called upon. And I just, I love him. I love his, I love his desire. I love his passion. I love his, just the way he handles himself. I love everything about the lad. And I think they're, them kind of players are really important. Like we've had Fletchers, we've had Sung Parks, we've had lads that have come in. Even go back to the days of Ollie, though. I'm not saying he's the same level as Ollie Gunnar Sorsha, but Ollie was happy to be that, call it the bench player to come in and do a job for you. If we can keep Scott McTominay in a similar vein and keep him happy enough to play 20, 25 games a season, but at the end of the day, 25 games a season for Man United, it's a lot of football, but if you can keep a fellow like that and keep numerous fellas, which is a tough job for a manager to do, keep numerous players of a sufficient quality happy enough to play that kind of role on the side, you're onto a winner. So that's where I can see massive improvement needed next season and having the likes of players of that level of ability or, or maybe better again to come in when we're missing players and do that job for us and, and get us over the injury crises or get us over like a, a striker to come in with, if Hyland is missing a someone to come in for Rasmus Hyland for a minute if you can keep them kind of players happy in the squad and they're they're happy to stay there for 20-25 games a season brilliant and he, he I think he is he's the kind of fellow who isn't look he's fresh off a, he's fresh off player of the year or player of the season for the Scottish national team and he's done a great job for us this season and I thought he was absolutely brilliant yesterday. He offered a hell of a lot. A lot of people were talking shit before the game when Casemiro was out injured and oh, it's going to be McTominay coming in. Lads, why, when do you not get it? Like he scored, assists, won that hitter. He did a fucking great job. Give credit where credit is due. You know I've, I've always been alongside you with McTominay and his importance to the squad. I think yesterday really epitomised everything that he has in the squad at the moment because you see the pros and you see the cons. He's he scored and he's assisted, which ultimately, if you want to win football games, you have to score. But when he's starting in that midfield position, you do see the flaws there because he leaves gaping holes. And you've got an 18 year old, Kabi Menu having to pick up the slack for him and what he lacks in that sort of dynamism that a midfielder is supposed to have. I think as we're moving forward with Sir Jim Radcliffe and this potential rebuild that we're looking at to have this best in class set up, 
we're going to see that his minutes will be limited. I would suspect that. And when we're speaking about a guy that's after turning 27 in December, he's approaching really that last big contract, isn't he? That last big contract that we hear about so much with top tier footballers. It's often why guys make that move, especially to England, to get that last big contract. Do you think between the two of you that at 27 and 28 in December, that McTominay will be totally content with 15 to 20 minutes per game and maybe going up against sort of cup sides like Newport that we've had? I don't think that the amount of games that McTominay is playing now needs to be significantly lowered. And I think if you asked me this a month or two ago, I totally agree with you. But either he deserves credit or Ten Hag, but maybe a share between both of them. But the manager, I think, deserves credit in finding him a role in this team. I think there was a bit of uncertainty. There was a start of the season when people were talking about McTominay being one of the ones that would should, should be sold. It was a real acceptance that he wasn't a midfielder, went hiding in games, wasn't really contributing enough. I think what we've seen now this season is someone that took some criticisms up on board or he's also reshaped his game. He has now a role in the team and he's popped up and scored some important goals this season, deserves big credit for that. I also think that when we're chopping players this summer, he should be the one that Ten Hag should be keeping because... Through a lot of the bumps that we've had this season, McTominay has been often the one that stood up and got really important goals. And I think that should stand to him, um, maybe as a test of loyalty. But there's a player there, I think, that Ten Hag, although he's limited, Ten Hag can trust him. I mean, going back to what I said a minute ago, when you're, when you're asking the question about his minutes and if they're going to drop off and whatnot, if you take the whole season into, into context, and if we are, hypothetically, if we're in Europe again next season, and we do get a cup run, you're talking 50 to 60 games. That's an, an, an animal amount of football. And unless you're Bruno Fernandes, who's this bionic man who never misses football matches, you're going to have lads out. You're going to have lads injured. You're going to have lads going through bad patches of form. It's it's imperative, and it's what's killing us this season. It's a squad game. It really is. You'll see players. Look at City. I hate giving any other team credit. It, it makes me sick in my mouth. But look at the likes of City. They have they're missing a couple of players. They've lads coming in off the bench with good quality, you know, like decent quality that can come in and do a great job. That's what you need if you want to compete at the top level these days with the amount of football that's involved. You need to have you need to almost have a second eleven sitting there waiting to go. But again, it's really, really hard for a manager or for any manager to keep that kind of level of football it's sufficient for lads that'll be happy to do that and to keep them like them lads sitting there happy, like they're not all going to be Sergio Romero's who are just happy to sit in the bench and collect their wage and come in once or twice a season. A lot of these lads want football, but as Dale said last season, there was talks of him leaving. If we're to believe what we're told or, or what we hear, he was absolutely fucking fuming. He was being cut, offered about or whatever the, the term he want to use is. He doesn't see his future away from Man United. He wants to stay and he wanted to stay and fight for his place or, or play whatever he can. And again, as Dale suggested, our role has changed. Maybe himself has changed a bit. And he's found that role that he can play for us. And I, I think if I was a guessing man, I think he's going to be happy with that role. He'll accept that. And he just wants to be at the club and, and be a United player. I don't think, maybe harshly enough for him, if he's going to leave United, where's he going to go? Like, At what level does he become a first team week in, week out player? Whereas if he stays at the club, even though he's not playing week in, week out, he's still a United player. He's still coming in playing big, important games. It's an exciting place to be at that level and he's still playing for a massive club, albeit it may only be 20 games a season. But Jesus, if I got 20 seconds for United, I'd be happy. And if he's the kind of fellow that I think he is with his love for the club, to know that he can offer 20, 25, 30 games a season, 30 is probably a bit much, but 20, 25 games a season, he's going to be happy with that. Like, I can't see how he wouldn't be. I know he's got a role to play and that he's an important role coming in, covering for lads. I, I, I don't see him leaving and I don't see him being unhappy to play the role he's in, if I was to predict. Just on what you were saying about squads and dealing with City and how City have two 11s practically that they can select from. Solskjaer did touch on this in an interview recently about the difficulties he had at United. And he spoke about, like, say, you can only tell a player so many times that you're not going to play this week. You'll get your chance next week. There's only so many weeks that's sustainable. And he spoke about the difficulties at this level of keeping people happy. I was thinking about it over the weekend, looking at Liverpool's squad. Uh, and they've they've been competitive in, in recent years. Klopp squ- has never really had a gigantic squad. And if you look, often look at the benches in re- previous seasons, there's often been lots of academy players and, and, and young players. 
And I wonder, is it a realization that he had? Because it's throughout his duration as Liverpool manager, he hasn't really had the problem of, of falling out with really any key players. It's been maybe one or two fallouts, Daniel Sturridge or whatever. But I wonder, is that how he's managed to kind of keep the group happy? But what you're running the risk with is when you have your seasons, and you will have them, of injuries and having lots of them, shit hits the fan. We've seen that with Liverpool in the past few years, two or three years ago, when they had their injuries across the fence to even finish in the top four. And this was a team that, when their players are fit, are pushing City for titles. And I don't think if we have our players fit this season, that we're that far away than what we look currently. I think the likes of Martinez and if Mount had his settling period longer with the full strength team, I think this United team would be in a much stronger position. Um, and again, if you look at our form since the turn of the new year, it's 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 quite impressive. Um, given what we've seen before Christmas. That age-old line that has become a Stratticast favourite, that availability is the greatest attribute of any player really comes to the fore when you're speaking about that. And that brings me to another man who I feel requires applause, recognition, for not yet just another fantastic performance, but what has been a growing catalogue of impressive performances throughout the season, and that is Diogo Dallo. Now, like you with McTominay, Brian, it's not that I've ever supplied a differing opinion to you on Scott, but I have defended the Portuguese defender since he arrived in Manchester. And while it appears that it has taken quite a bit of time for him to establish himself, the now 25-year-old may very well have got to a point where the club will no longer have to go out and shell out a small fortune on a right-back. How much of the fan base needs to acknowledge not only his immense growth this season, but the fact that we possibly have a right back for the next six, seven, eight years at our disposal. Not often it happens, but I'm very, very close to having to eat my words on Diogo Dallo because I went through a, a large period of time where I said, no, nah, he's not going to make it. I don't like him. I don't think he's good enough. I don't think he offers this, that and the other thing. Even up to, even up to lately, up, up to the start of the year, I, I still think he's a bit weak defensively, if I'm being completely honest. I really do. I think there's there's aspects to his game. He switches off. He can lose concentration. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's not as it's not as imperative a position as it once was to buy someone. There was a time when Juan Basaka went through a purple patch and everyone thought he was the best. Then Dallo came in and he had a purple patch. Everyone thought he was the best. Then they were both shite. It's this non-stop kind of a merry-go-round of which one of the two of them is actually the strongest right back for us. But Dello, I think, has definitely staked, staked his claim at this stage for it. I probably wouldn't focus on a right back in the summer and left back is definitely after rearing its head as the more imperative position to strengthen. But Dello has probably shown promise and fairness to him of becoming the player he possibly could be for us. And I'm all for it. I'm all for eating my words about a player. If a fella proves me wrong 100%, I'm, I'm delighted for him to do that. He's, he's a fella who's he's funny in the sense that he's a chest pump and chest beaten ultra passionate guy and he's the kind of guy you kind of do want on the side and he's the kind of guy you kind of do want to be a good enough player because that kind of energy and passion can only serve any side well he obviously looks like he loves it but a funny one I was in the away end in Anfield geez maybe two years ago or three years ago two years two or three years ago can't remember which one and I was stood beside Dallas mother I think his missus and her and his or her best friend. And of course, I didn't know who he was or who they were. So I may have passed a comment about Della being shite on the same day. And these three had faces like thundering them. And I was like, oh, yeah, uh, you don't agree with me. Right. No, 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 no. Uh, that's that's my son. I said, oh, bollocks. Put my fucking foot in it here. Haven't I? I says, oh, yeah. So I kind of tried to pass it off and make light of it. And I says, um, and what do you reckon? You know, is he going to is he going to make it at the club? And is he having a good time? And the manager was so sure, I think. And she said, yeah, I just don't think the manager sees it that way. And she was like a dog about it. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, why do I get myself in these positions? But fairest to be stuck it out and he's doing well. So more power to him. I hope he makes me, he makes me eat my words long term and he becomes a solid right back for us. Just one of the things with that, I guess, is you know, Ronaldo always wants to quote Ronaldo or by everything he says. But one of his... Um, 
when he was praising Dado was on his work rate and training and how he's such a hard worker. And if Ronaldo was saying that about someone, and we're now seeing this kind of not just improvements in performance because Dallow was always capable of a good performance. He had the ability. What we're seeing now is consistency. When you see a player start playing with a bit of consistency, that's when you start to say, right, we might have something on our hands here. And I, would, I wouldn't be completely sold just yet because I reckon Wan-Bissaka will be leaving in the summer. And I still think we need to go into the market for a right back. But what maybe we can go for now is with Dallow doing so well, is go for a young right back with potential that can come in with you know maybe challenge Dallow a bit or push him, give him competition. But I wouldn't be going out to sign a someone that's a superstar right back. I don't think we necessarily need that. Maybe more so on the left hand side. Even Ronaldo's massive outcry of rage about how things hadn't changed at the club, and he went into the depth of slating the tiles in the swimming pool. I believe if he's given a fellow confidence and a bit of a, a, a pat on the back for being a good work rate and whatnot and he's anything positive that came out of his time at United is obviously fair uh, a fair recommendation of a player so he mustn't be that bad in fairness to him. one thing that always stands out for me with Dallo we're in an era of tactical football whereby the role of a fullback has morphed so so much and so many of the modern fullbacks are either attacking fullbacks or they're defensive fullbacks there's very, very few that combine the best of both worlds. And as Dallow continues to excel this season, he continues to put in a number of impressive performances. It's not one good one, two bad ones. It's regular good performances. We've gone from seeing a regular six and a half or seven out of ten to a guy who's pushing up towards seven and a half and eight out of ten. Uh, three of the key metrics that stand out for him for me kind of buy into what I feel Ten Hag is trying to achieve. And their metrics that see him go from the 91st to the 92nd percentile in the Premier League. One is his uh, defensive touches. So henceforth, the amount of times he's picking up the ball in defensive transitions and in that build-up play. And he's ranking in the 91st percentile in that. He also ranks in the 91st percentile for the amount of dribblers that he tackles, which is the complete opposite side of touching the ball in that. But even more impressive with this as well, he's in the 93rd percentile for successful long balls completed for a fullback. So you're looking at a guy who's picking up the ball regularly, who is not only aiding in the starting of transitions, but also launching it and creating these fantastic counterattacks that we saw so much against Liverpool. But then he's there in that defensive side as well. I think he's one of the very, very few players that while, as I said a couple of weeks ago, I'm not necessarily sold that he is the guy to lead us there for the next six, seven, eight years, although he does have the potential to do so. He's of a very, very rare ilk where he supplies more than enough going forward and going back to put him in a very, very rare echelon of fullback that still exists in 2024. You know, there was a long-term debate there when Juan Bissaka was at his best, we'll say, for United. And it touches exactly on what you were saying there about attacking fullbacks and defensive fullbacks. The big massive debate was Trent Alexander Arnold, phenomenal going forward, absolutely dog shit defender. Armand Basaka, phenomenal defender at the time, dog shit going forward. And like you say, if you could get Juan Basaka being far more productive and better going forward, he'd be brilliant because he's very he's a very, very solid defensive player, hundred percent. He's just fucking ridiculously bad going forward. Dallow at the time was better going forward, but weak defensively. But now, he's start, as you said, he's starting to morph into more kind of a balanced and level player where he, ha- he brings both to his side. He's definitely, um, he's definitely a capable right back. I mean, if he can... I've always been down on his defensive side. I thought his going forward was always fine. He was always fairly fairly solid and he offered enough going forward to play well at, at United and at that level. I just thought defensively he was a bit weak, but he seems to have kind of copped on defensively a bit and he seems to have woken up to the fact that he was falling asleep at the back post for want of better term at times. He's changed that around a bit now in fairness. He's kind of started to started to just put in, like you said, them solid performances on both levels, forward and back. And that's like, people were always going on, like Liverpool fans were always on about Trent alexander Aaron. Oh, he's amazing. He's offering so much going forward and he's shooting and he's crossing. He's, he was putting in fucking 67 crosses a game, which were meet, meeting their target maybe twice. It looks great. It's phenomenal to watch. But like defensively, he was fucking rotten. And that you do need that. Like I always had that debate with Liverpool fans and even with United fans and Wan-Bissaka. Oh, he's, he's the best fucking defensive right back in the world. That's grand. 
But in the modern game, which unfortunately we're in, it's not the 4-4-2 era, which I cry out for the whole time. It is the modern game. You have to accept that. You need a defender, left and right back, that are both capable of obviously doing their first defensive duties, but also being able to bomb forward and supply that outlet. The likes of Luke Shaw linking up with Rashford and playing the little one-twos and then Shaw does the overlap. You need that from the likes of Dallow. You can go back to Gary Neville, a fellow who, a solid, solid defender, but he was always willing to bomb down the line and offer that outlet and he could go down outside his right midfielder and offer that extra pass and swing a ball in. That you st- you need that right now, and that's what we're crying out for on both wings. Because if your wingers, this modern football thing, I, 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 you both know it fucking does my head in, but it's gone to the stage where your left and right back need to be well capable of supplying good balls into the box and supplying an attacking outlet as much as they have to be defensively. So Dallow has definitely rounded his game off an awful lot because he was way stronger going forward than he was working in the back. And Testament to the fellow, look, he's, he's he's put the head down within reason and he's he's turned his game around an awful lot and he has definitely improved all round. I'm, I'm not too disappointed. There was a stage where I was looking at him being named in the starting 11 and I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, I don't like this fellow at all. I'm gone to the stage where I don't actually even consider that when I see his name. He's, I've gone past that. I'm looking at other avenues. So that shows that he's obviously turned it around enough that my focus is, is, has changed, you know, so fair play to the fellow. And I'm sorry to his mother as well for slating the shit out of him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're speaking about wingers, Brian. That brings us to Marcus Rashford. And a lot of the focus could have potentially been on the opportunity that he was presented with that apparent opportunity to write his name into the headlines of every news report in the dying seconds of the game. Although confirmation afterwards confirmed that any goal would not have stood due to a marginal offside. So for me anyway, I'm glad that he missed that because if VAR had ruled that out, it would have been utterly, utterly diabolical. But he did manage to net a crucial goal in injury time. And that is now his seventh against Mr. Virgil van Dijk. That's just for the record of anybody listening here. Brian Dale, as a trio, we've asked for muddy shorts when he's walking off the pitch to show that he cares, to show that he's putting in a performance for his boyhood club. Are we pleased with the 120 minutes that he supplied outside of the goal? No. Um, Much like we're not pleased with his performances all season. Not good enough. I think Rashford, again, I'm watching him now with the perspective that he's not this kid anymore, which he's not. And again, yesterday, as we've done for much of the season, relying on academy graduates. I'm not one that doesn't enjoy that because as a United fan, there's nothing better than that. But I just think that Marcus Rashford, and not being harsh on him, but he is not doing enough in my eyes for those guys coming into the team, for some, for them to look up to, and to, as an example, and I just think, look, I'm not going to ever go in harsh on a player for missing a golden opportunity, but you never hear me go in harsh on Garnacho because he might miss the odd one, but he'll keep going, he'll keep going, threatening at them and annoying defenders and plugging away. He doesn't give up and he takes risks and he's just, do you know what? I know you're, you asked me the question about Rashford, and I went off on Garnacho, but. I said it a few weeks ago that I didn't think Rashford was our star anymore. He's not. Garnacho is. He's only fucking 19. He is the star now. And like every week we seem to be talking about Rashford. Do you know what? Let's not make him the story anymore. Because the story with Rashford all season has just been constantly negative. Because you can't have a positive opinion on it. We're all desperate to speak positively about Rashford. That's why we talk about it. We're so fucking, you know baffled by it but I don't think he's worth the conversation until he pulls his socks off and shows what what we all know he's capable of the star is Garnacho one thing I did say to the, to the lads that were with me yesterday about the game or about Rashford and this topic is whether he was or wasn't offside in this essentially is immaterial because in that moment you have to put the ball in the net he had was a two absolutely Fucking glorious chances. One in particular. Absolutely glorious chances. You have to bury them. And then you take, you roll the dice with VAR and see what happens. But if you don't put that into the net, the VAR doesn't come into it. The decision never gets talked about. You can't be missing them. Like, Jesus Christ, they're absolutely glorious. Glorious chances. I was, I was very disappointed that he missed them. Um, but I will agree with you, Dale, on one thing. The star of the team has 100% changed. And it's... It's all about Garnacho now as as the superstar, without doubt. 
again, we spoke about it last week and we, we made comparisons to Ronaldo's time when he came in first and he was frustrating and he was a little bit rough around the edges, which Ganacho is, but gladly we're level headed enough and we have the ability to say that we understand he's going to be a little bit rough around the edges. He's a kid coming through and we can accept that. We can accept the mistakes and if he does make an absolute bollocks or something, you're instantly going to say, ah, oh, for fuck's sake. But then you're also instantly going to go, listen, relax, don't go too mad, he's only a fucking kid, don't go too hard on him. He offers us more pluses than he does negatives. He's really, really fucking exciting to watch. I love watching him play football. And it's funny how he's gone from, he was the left-sided winger, now he's after making the right side absolutely his own position, without a shadow of a doubt. And right midfield for us was a position where we've pumped money into it, we've been crying out for something to click, We've been crying out for someone to just take that spot and Sancho couldn't do it. Anthony couldn't do it. Garnacho has done it in spades. And I, it, it's really good to watch him. And again, yesterday he was, he was phenomenal. But Rashford, I've said it, I've said it out loud in this, on this podcast. I've said it on Twitter. The reason I'm so disappointed in Rashford is because I and all of you know what he's capable of. We know what he's able to do. And that's all we want to see. We want to see Marcus Rashford performing, scoring, setting up goals, sticking the finger to the side of his head doing his celebration. That's the Rashford that we know. We know it's in there. It's it's in there. Deep down, it's in there. He's shown it last season. And that's why everyone is, is constantly talking about him. That's why he's a topic the whole time. Because that's the player we know that's there. And we're just not seeing it. And it's fucking annoying. And it's really frustrating to watch him play football and not see him play that way and not see him producing and seeing him with the head down and a bit of a, a bit of a, a post him at times. I didn't. I didn't think he was fantastic yesterday by any means. He, he had a couple of half chances. He had two class chances, but they were probably offside. But again, offside or not, bury him and then worry about it afterwards. But Rashford just isn't. He's just not doing it. And I think I don't know if it was you, Sean, or, or Dale last week said this was the game where he can literally turn around and try and kickstart it again because it's obviously the stage is set in such a big game against Liverpool. And he didn't take that chance. He really didn't. Like Kabi Menu stepped up and became. A big talking point. Garnacho was a big talking point. Rashford wasn't. And it's disappointing. Well, I think it's fitting what, what both of you are saying. And it's almost impossible when you're speaking about Rashford now not to bring Garnacho into the same conversation. I think with those two players, when you use the, the comparison between the both of them, the fundamental issues of Rashford really come to the fore. You said which one of us said that this was a game that he could kick on. The both of us probably said it because half the hand, half the fan base are probably saying it. But something that I did speak about the last time that we really, really went in uh, to a, a, an in-depth conversation with Marcus Rashford was how I felt that he really lacked good footballing IQ. And when you consider Rashford against Garnacho, Garnacho runs and runs and runs. And he certainly left the field with mud on his shorts yesterday because regardless of the mistakes that he's making, he's no nobody can question his effort. But then when you look at Rashford and you see the mistakes that Rashford is making, these are the mistakes that Garnacho should be making because this is only a sprog coming onto the football field trying to learn his trade. As you've touched upon, Dale, Rashford is supposed to be setting the example and setting the benchmark for these young guys coming forward. Yet, week in, week out, we see him making the fundamental errors that young lads should be making themselves, not him. And when we speak about nailing down different sides of the wings, I think we're getting to the point, especially with Sir Jim Radcliffe coming in, where despite his star value that is there, there's nothing guaranteed in any way, shape or form that he's going to be able to hold that down for, for years and years to come. But one thing I want to say to both of you, because you're saying that the star has passed between Rashford to Garnacho, I'll go one further and I'll say that the star has passed from those positions altogether and gone into the central midfield because Kabi Menu to me again was an absolute revelation against Liverpool yesterday. I touched upon it maybe about 15-20 minutes ago with Scott McTominay and how his obvious flaws come to the fore when he's playing in midfield and he leaves those gaps. Kabi Menu at 18 years of age played against two Liverpool midfielders himself yesterday because he constantly had to make up the ground that was being left open by McTominay due to his lack of tactical awareness in that midfield role. And week in, week out, we're seeing a footballer that I said at 18 years of age it's very hard to look at him and not see a guy who looks like he's 30 years of age. He certainly doesn't play like an 18-year-old. And some of the space and some of the technical bravado that he pulled off yesterday in moments where it just seemed like it was improbable for him to keep the ball 
you, you, you do not see teenagers doing this at the highest level in football. And for me, if you were coming in as Jim Radcliffe and Ineos Aaron, you're looking to rebuild this side and to look at who you can build the team around, despite the number of very, very impressive people that we have at that squad. Kabi Menu has the ability to be a genuine world beater. We, we, we hear this term passed around so much about a generational talent, a generational talent. Well, Kabi Menu is the definition of that to me. You know, we, we, we wax lyrical so much about Barcelona's youth academy and the conveyor belt of youth players that they have coming through. If Kabi Menu was playing for Barcelona, you would say, yeah, of course. Of course he came through that academy. Because this is a player that embodies everything from professionalism, physicality, maturity, technical ability, positional awareness, and just the overall ability to be able to understand a man's game when he's only a child. And for me personally, I think that we have a footballer who can literally lead a group of 10 other players towards all of these title runs that we want to achieve over the next five to 10 years. Am I, am I hyping it too much or do you go along with that? You're definitely hyping it too much if, if, if he was listening to this. I wouldn't want them to, to, to hear that. Um, but I think you're bang on. I don't think, I don't think you can hype Cobby too much because he's come into a side... I won't say out of nowhere because we knew he was coming within reason, but and you can always get excited about academy pro- product products before they actually get to the first team. You go, oh, he's the next one. He's going to make it. He's going to make it. And we make these claims, and a lot of fellas make these claims, but loads of fellas, and it never ends up coming true. But he's just walked into that team and just gone, "This is my position. This is my team. I'm going to run the show now." Like I've seen him bollock Casemiro on the pitch. At 18 years of age, Casemiro's, I think, a five, I don't know how many Champions Leagues Casemiro's won. He's won fucking Everton, I think, five times. Copy made him at 18, bollocked him. And I looked at him and this fella has balls the size of fucking coconuts. Like, to come into this side and give Casemiro that much of an eaten. But it's not. The fact that Casemiro took it on the chin and didn't bite back at him is testament to how good this kid can be. And that, like, that's a shining example of Casemiro going, fair enough, yeah. I accept it. Let's move on. Let's 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 do it. He's fucking phenomenal to watch. Like it's it's funny. Do you know, I'm still getting used to Cobby Mayo being in the side because he's only come into the side this season. I'm still getting used to seeing him there, and I still get blown away by how composed he is. He's just ridiculous. Like his timing of his tackles and the fact he turns up in these positions and comes in with these clean tackles out of nowhere, but then he he makes the tackle. And not just does he make the tackle, he gets up, gets the ball and drives on and you're like, going, Jesus Christ, this fucking lad is class. He, he did a little dribble yesterday and I was, I said to one of the boys, I said, was that Cobby Maynard? And they're like, no, no, I think that was Rashford. I said, no, I, said, I think it was Cobby. And we looked at each other going, with kind of half a smile going, hardly was him, was it? And then they showed the replay, I was like, that was fucking Cobby Maynard against Liverpool in a knockout FA Cup game of this magnitude. And he just did a little fucking dribble and skill past two or three players. And my jaw was on the floor going, you are one cheeky little fucker, lad. Fair fucks to you. He's absolutely top class. And I'll give it to Sean. You're probably right. Garnacho is a star in the sense that he gets the plaudits because he scores the goals and it's more kind of a headline making. But when you're looking at a fellow who does the dirty work and does the things that make a team tick at that age, at this level and at his ability, I literally cannot wait, and I'm going to say it straight out, I cannot wait to see where his career can go, and I cannot wait to see what he can achieve in this game with Manchester United, because this fella, <laughs> I'm almost going to Yanazai levels, and Yanazai hurt me to, to a deep, deep extent, because there was a stage when Yanazai came through, probably because we were crying out for some bit of happiness at that stage. Yanazai broke my heart, and I'll probably never get over the fact that I, I left when PSG were linked for 50 million for him. I was like, go ahead and fuck yourselves, 50 million. He's worth a billion. But Kabi Menu is, is a kid I look at and go, this guy is going to just, he's going to sit into this side and he's going to be something special for many, many years to come. If we can keep this, if we can keep this little element of kids, we call them kids, but keep this element of young lads coming through together without any of them getting either a serious injury or leaving the club or anything like that. And if they can progress at the rate they're progressing, because Garnacho's come in and gone fucking phenomenal very quickly. Manu's doing the same. 
Hyland came in and was hit and miss at the start and all of a sudden hit the ground and bang, everyone sat up and watched him and went, fuck, he is a striker, isn't he? We have a couple of lads on that side that are capable of being superstars. And if we can build a team around them and add the, the sufficient quality to support that, we're on the right track big time. The one thing I will say, and I haven't heard a murmur for every one of you fuckers that are listening, I haven't heard a murmur of anyone saying anything about Tin Hag since yesterday. I hope to God that Eric Ten Hag is the man to do this. I hope to God Eric Ten Hag is trusted to continue his time with Manchester United because people left. And I won't lie, I'll be honest, after the City game, I wasn't sure what to expect from that Liverpool game yesterday. I was blindly and stupidly optimistic we were going to win. I don't really know why. I had no real basis for it. But I looked at the City game and went, yeah, we have to go back to the wall here and fucking pray. We went out yesterday and we still have a ball of injuries. And we went out with Aaron one Basaka left back, which is a curious one if you looked at it on paper a couple of months ago. Made sense on the day. Kami Menu in centre midfield, Scott McTominay. And we went toe to toe with him. And I was a bit surprised. I won't lie, I was, I actually was very surprised. Open five minutes against Everton the last day, we were absolutely fucking diabolically bad. First 15 minutes against Liverpool yesterday, I was sitting there going, this is fucking, this is class. This is unreal. I'm really enjoying this. And he, we, we went we went out there and we danced with them and we got the win. And one of the things I, I was more happy with, I'm so used to seeing these massive games, no matter who the, what the club it is, but particularly United and Liverpool. It's one of the oldest and most hated and deepest rivalries in football. So sick of these games being built up all week and everyone's getting excited. They turn out to be an absolute dog shit nil all or a one nil or some fluke one side batters the other side. Yesterday was an absolute fucking slobber knocker of a game 4-3 cup game going at it at each other toe to toe over and back anybody could have won that game at any stage it was the most enjoyable game of football I've watched in a long time and I said it a couple of or you asked me a while back about what was I thinking about the Liverpool game and I do hate playing them. I absolutely despise it because it's a, it's a nervy game and if you lose it's sick but that was an enjoyable game of football yesterday that's what football is go at each other outscore the opponent fucking go toe to toe and fight for the win and get it last minute Diallo winner sweet Jesus like I mean that, that's football and one of the one of the most amusing things that came out of yesterday wake me up before you go go who needs Sancho when we've got Diallo I love it and on that one right there we are speaking for over 40 minutes it's time to land on Diallo he entered the field in the 85th minute and I think not only did he supply one of the most memorable moments that we've had in quite some time, I think he delivered an inspiring performance, which could be assessed from every angle of the field. He, he was involved in the majority of attacking phases, and he also put in an immense defensive shift. Now, while I think it is so stupid to dismiss a player for that particular shirt defence at that particular moment in that game, I know it's clear as day that the rule exists. He's going to miss the opportunity for minutes against Brentford after the international break. But was this his moment? And was that what was required to propel himself into real first-team recognition? Yeah, it, absolutely. Because we're now looking at a team every week. We're talking about Garnacho, um, Cobby, and these are players that when they got their opportunity, they took, their, they took it with two arms. And... I don't think for Ahmad coming into the team when he gets his minutes, just doing the odd little bit, giving glimpses is enough because we're seeing the standards, our standards of this team will now start to increase with the likes of Garnaccio and Kavi in it. You need to do something special. He's certainly done that. He has definitely warranted a place in the manager's minds when it comes to games when we need to bring someone on off the bench because there was times recently where he was overlooked Ten Hag was getting criticism from a few quarters over that. But I think Ten Hag, again, deserves credit because you can't just rush these boys back. Nine times out of ten, we don't know the specific details of their injuries or recovery process. Ten Hag always keeps his cards close to his chest. We don't know how players are getting back and from what niggles and whatever. I think Ten Hag has been patient with him. I think he, he knows how difficult it is because... Palestri got minutes, didn't pull up trees. I don't think he showed that he was really of the required standard. But for what we've seen yesterday from Ahmad, he couldn't have done any more. And I reckon we, we will see more of him again soon. He deserves it. You just mentioned someone who I was literally waiting to comment on. 
Pellistry wouldn't have come in and done that. It's as simple. It's simple as that. He wouldn't. He doesn't have it in him. And you're looking, rightly so, a lot of people questioned why Diallo isn't getting minutes and why he's not getting a chance. And it's a fair question, yeah. You're looking for a lad like him who's gone out and low and proven himself. He should be getting a chance. And you're kind of waiting going, geez, he's surely going to get a game. He's surely going to get a game. And he hasn't. And as you're kind of suggesting there, look, maybe Tin Hag has seen something or maybe he's had reasons to do it. We can only trust that. When you're saying, how did he perform yesterday? How did he come in and announce himself? He literally came in and said, hi, I'm Ahmed Diallo and I should be playing games or I should be more involved in this team. He was fucking brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. And like like Sean just touched on, defensively, he came out of nowhere with some tackles and I was going, where, where the fuck is, where is that other after coming out of? He was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. He put in a really energetic shift, offered a great option, attacking-wise, defensively. You talk, as, as Dale said, you talk about lads coming in, taking their chance, and that's what you expect a fella to do when they come on and they are finally given a chance. He took with both arms and he just literally said, here I am, I'm waiting to play, give me time. He was he was brilliant and I'd expect him to get more time. But it struck me because we talked about Pellistry a few times. There was a lot of talk about why is Pellistry getting his chance and Diallo isn't and whatnot. Obviously, Tin Hag saw something in Pellistry that was worth giving it to him. Maybe it was in training or whatever, but he never did. But like Pellistry wouldn't have that performance in him. Diallo came in and he was a fucking live wire. He was really exciting, really good to watch. Someone asked me today on Twitter, where does he fit into the team? Because X player plays here and X player plays there. It goes back to what I was saying earlier in the podcast. You don't always have to look at a player and go pick a position in the starting 11 for him. It's a squad game. His time will come. We can't always be looking at players and going, oh, we need him to start now and attack him at field or right wing. No. We need depth. We need options. We need to be able to rotate. We need to be able to change it up. If Ga- if Ganacho goes off form for a couple of weeks, you need someone to come in. If Look at the number 10 spot for the sake of argument. Bruno hits a bad form or, or gets injured. You need options. It doesn't always have to be a focus on can they be in the starting 11 week in, week out. You need to have a chance to have lads that come in and do a job and change things up. Tactically, options for playing different type of football, injuries, I, I really wish people could get it, just take a deep breath and say, right, we need to build a squad. And Diallo, I know it's only a, a, a small case study from yesterday, but he's made a, a massive statement of being part of that squad. And it's good to have, yet again, another option. We spoke about McTominay being playing that role. I'm not saying that's the kind of role Diallo is going to have by any means, but it is an option for now that you have that kind of guy coming in to do something effective. How many times since Christmas have we looked at the bench and gone, Jesus Christ, there's nothing there. That's just nothing on that bench to change a game, especially attacking wise. There's nothing there. Like if we're if this game isn't going great, Ten Hag hasn't got a whole point of things he can do to change this. If you've got a Diallo chomping at the bit on the bench and he's an option to come in and change it, you're laughing because he can come in and offer something totally different to tiring defences. When defences start getting a bit tired, and that little fucker comes on and starts running your ragged, they're going to look at him, oh Jesus, not him. So I can see him getting more minutes for sure. I'm glad he finally did get a chance. Big game for him. And he couldn't have taken it in more spectacular fashion. That goal's going to go down in history. And fair folks to him, he's the one that's there that did it. So top class from him. Plaudits to him 100%. Brilliant. Just off for a bit of a side note, um, he did an interview with Club Media recently on his return from injury. And they asked him about his objectives at United for the foreseeable future. And he spoke about his first goal for the club against AC Milan, the Europa League, which was in the San Zero. And his objective was he could not wait to score a goal in front of United fans at Old Trafford. Um, so when he did that yesterday, what a way to do it. You know, the, the, the noise when that goal to go, goes in to win it. So, And he, he did an interview after the match. He comes across quite quite as a humble character. Um, he was quick to kind of speak about how he's fasting at the moment with Ramadan on. Like, he put all these in, things into into perspective it's quite remarkable that he went out there and can only can only come on towards the end but put in an almighty shift and as you mentioned the goal we're never going to forget and just as well a quick one i think that game yesterday is one of the greatest games in manchester united history especially if we go on to win the the fa cup when he said he was looking forward and one of his objectives were to score in old trafford and for the united fans what a fucking way to do it because you can score a shitty goal in a two-all draw or you can come on and win it in the 121st minute against your most hated rivals in a knockout game 
and send the entire stadium into raptures. I mean, the videos of this, the reaction of the fans when that goal went in from every single corner of the ground was phenomenal. Can I just ask if you think that was the Mark Robbins moment? Ooh, big shout, big shout. The only reason I'm going to say no is because for it to be the Mark Robbins moment, you'd have to have, be of the opinion that Tin Hag was that close to going tits up and I don't think he's anywhere near that so in a sense yes in a sense of an iconic goal an iconic goal FA Cup very end manager is under pressure it's only iconic if it actually leads to something that's the difference here people get so far ahead of themselves it's only iconic if United go on to win the FA Cup and then people look back at it and they say that moment Ahmad scores Old Trafford goes wild it leads to this memorable cup run where United potentially get their, the, you know, they get their own back in City after 12 months prior. It's, um, it's all about what they do next. So much of this squad is, is reactionary. We saw a very poor performance against Everton that led to a two-goal win and three points. We saw a fantastic performance yesterday that was spirited, but it has to lead to something. I'd say it's more a Ryan Giggs versus Arsenal goal if I was to compare it to any goal at the moment. Yeah. It was the goal that could be the one, as Sean said, it's this. It's the snatch and grab, last minute winner out and over, sensational reaction that could be the one that causes us to go on and win it. And of course, look, not playing down Coventry, we'll get to that. But if we do happen to get past Coventry and play City, if we can hold it tight at the back for thirteen seconds, it's an improvement on last season and Dimmer with a chance. So this could be the one. Yeah, it could be the spark that leads to a, a, a very, a very nice cup win. And what a moment it is. But I suppose, Mark, not, not downplaying your comparison there in the Mark Robbins situation, but I'd, I'd go more of a gigs arsenal comparison. A lot as well about the goal as well. It won't get brought into it, but you have 120 minutes of Garnacho running his socks off. So when that final ball came from Garnacho to Ahmad, it was lacking ever so slightly, which is perfectly fine, perfectly understandable because he's going to be tired, he's going to be fatigued. But the ability that Ahmad had to be able to take that ball to bring it forward in the manner he did and to hit that finish. He put it in about the only place that Cuivin Kelleher was not going to be able to get a hand to it. It was genuinely perfect in every aspect of the word. I don't think we can let this podcast pass without giving a nod to Tin Hag for his substitutions, his tactical play, and for playing Bruno Fernandes centre-back and Anthony left-back. I mean... If you spoke about it before the game, you'd laugh at someone and think it was absolutely ludicrous. Ten Hag gets enough shit off everyone and he gets slated for everything and getting things wrong and getting this wrong and whatnot. Give the man a bit of fucking pat in the back and a bit of credit for it. He got it right yesterday. And I won't lie, my eyebrows were raised at some of the decisions at the time. But he proved me completely wrong. It worked. I don't know how, but it worked. But Eric Ten Hag is after pulling off an iconic, and it is an iconic win, against Liverpool. It's a win that will be spoke about for years. It's a game. Dale just suggested it's one of the best games he's ever seen. It's it's one of the best games at Old Trafford. I've, I've seen people talk about it. I'm absolutely on my knees fume when I didn't go to that game yesterday. I'm fucking raging I wasn't there. But even from watching it inside in the pub with the lads and speaking to boys, all my own mates that were at the game yesterday, to hear how they talk about the atmosphere inside in Old Trafford. Funnily enough, Andy Mitten earlier today said the main stand at Old Trafford has gone wild for the first time since 1980 something which is a kind of a joking way of saying that the atmosphere was literally top notch that's you, you can't play down the importance of that game or, or the importance of what it could do to this side because people relay back to the 7-0 against Liverpool and say that's the one that fucking destroyed us and that's the one that caused all this downturn who's to say this isn't possibly the one that could cause the upturn and it's also a massive two fingers to that prick Jürgen Klopp on his final season who absolutely embarrassed himself afterwards in his interview when he acted a complete baby and dickhead when he was being interviewed and walked off and threw a big hissy fit. What a lovely, lovely way to say, Jürgen, thanks for calling. Now fuck off home. And at that, the draw was made shortly after the final whistle and we're speaking about Mark Robbins. It almost seems like it was written in the stars that Ten Hag will now face off against a man who many believe saved Sir Alex Ferguson's job during that memorable cup win in 1990. With the draw pitting United against Coventry and City facing off against Chelsea, 
Coventry are currently eighth in the championship and like ourselves, they face somewhat of an outside shot of making the playoffs while we're looking for that outside shot of making top four. Although none of us are ever going to overlook any opponent in any way, shape or form, particularly at that stage of the competition, there's a real opportunity, Dale, that we may be looking at back-to-back Manchester Derby FA Cup finals. Yeah, we should be, and I think we will be. Um, it, this is, again, as I said, it started a podcast, my difficult season, but when you throw out that stat, the back-to-back FA Cup finals, it's not a bad feat. It shows, again, what we really want f- when Ten Hag came to the club is we wanted Manchester United back challenging again and back competing. We're not quite there with the, the league and we didn't expect to be there in two or years' time. But we are there in the cup competitions. The Carabao Cup didn't go our way this year, but we won it last year. Our first trophy in six years. And as now we're talking about back-to-back, potentially FA Cup finals, it's progression. Um, And again, of course, we need to go 13 seconds against City without conceding. That would be the true mark of progression. But I think, look, again, I'm, I'm absolutely beaming. Throwing everything into perspective, because on this podcast this season, a lot of the questions are coming in about the manager and how bad things have been. And we've time and time again talked about the injuries and what he's been facing. Now, I think when we're looking at that result yesterday against Liverpool, let's keep those things into account. And look at the key players that we were missing yesterday against a Liverpool team that's challenging for a title. And again, I, th- I really think we deserve that win. Like 4 3. Two of their goals were fucking deflections. You know, I was there thinking at one point, how, how unlucky we, are we? Those jammy bastards, two of the goals have taken massive, dirty deflections. And it, it's such a game of fine margins. And then you look at the, the chances that we blew. There was one McTominay should have scored. Then Rashford's one. But, no, look, Everton considered. We we weren't, we were underdogs yesterday and stood up finally this season. And as a result, we can cling on to now. I'm going to put the two of you to the sword here because I love doing this. Do either of you know the last time Manchester United and Coventry City locked horns? Absolutely no idea. And I won't lie. How about you, Dale? Any idea? Nope. The last time that these two sides locked horns was the 26th of September 2007. It was a League Cup third round meeting at Old Trafford, a massively, massively rotated site for United. And it was a 2 0 home defeat. So Coventry came to Manchester and they won their first game against United since the 28th of December 1997. So this is a side now that obviously put in a very impressive performance against Wolves. They they won it in the depth themselves and claimed a, a historic victory for Robins. And they're going to be relishing this opportunity. You can be guaranteed when they saw that draw and they have a chance of City, Chelsea or United. I know they're thinking brilliant three premiership sides, but I guarantee you every single one of those players and supporters wanted Manchester United in the semi-final. Hope for Ball boy's sake, they all behave themselves at Wembley because there was a bit of an issue with Mr. Robbins on the weekend. But Coventry, I'd expect Coventry, obviously, their fans are going to be utterly buzzing to get a Wembley day out. Like, that's any fellow going to football matches, Wembley days out are fucking brilliant. I don't expect them to be like the Newcastle fans were last season and go around fucking frolicking in fountains and acting like absolute fucking lemons. It's a crack and play. Obviously, from our perspective, you're looking at the three possible oppositions and you're going, Jesus, Coventry is the one you want to get because not downplaying them by any means. To get to an FA Cup semi-final is a massive feat for any club. It shows how good they are, even as a championship side. It's it's amazing for them, but it's obviously, it's our, it's our chance at, at getting another cup final, which I hope we do. Um, you should, on paper, like obviously we should, we should beat them on paper, but again, with cup ties, you just never know what's going to happen. I'm quietly hoping Chelsea might do something unexpected and, and shaft City because I'd love to play Chelsea in the final because I think we'd make bits of them. I don't particularly want to go up against City again because that's a mammoth task. But it is, it's, it's, it's a great, isn't it great to have another day out of Wembley? Isn't it just fucking great to be just, to be able to go to Wembley again as, as lads that go to football matches and be able to head down off to London, off to Wembley with a fucking 30,000 or so Reds Take me home, United Road, 
fucking roaring out on the sidelines. It, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. I can't wait for it. I, I hope, I hope amongst hope that we don't do anything silly and, and get turned over and we can see ourselves heading off for another cup final. Cracking. Oh, it's we a, go visit it's some a... of the fountains and have a washing them. <laughs> it's an immense prospect, but there is a narrative on the other side of that draw as well because Pochettino is under ferocious pressure at Chelsea. And this is presenting the real opportunity that he might be looking at to potentially save his job. So I don't think Chelsea are going to be a turnover for City in any way. And the two performances they had in the Premier League this year, they were very, very competitive against them. It's almost like Chelsea, I'm not going to say that they have City's number, but they know how to play against them. They know what it takes to beat them. And any game, a one-off game in Wembley, can go any possible way. A lot of people would probably call me stupid for saying this, but I would love another crack at City in the final. I know the pain in losing to them in the final is utterly awful, but I would love to be the side that beat them in that final. I absolutely would love it. You've made it this far and you've had a few giggles along the way but there is one more thing that we want you to do you gotta hit that subscribe button wherever you are listening right now let's be honest you know yourself your playlist is duller than a rainy night in stoke so why don't you let the boys from Streddycast put a smile on your face and a spring in your step it's gonna cost you nothing and it's gonna help us to make even more ridiculous content for you every single week you know it i had you at hello so subscribe now and fall in love with the stretty cast <laughs> last but most certainly not least we have our glorious listeners questions to get to and we're going to start it off with mr Lazarat morf from facebook and he's asking lads at this stage of the season with Ineos potentially looking at a squad overhaul, just how important will players like Scott McTominay and Aaron Wan Bissaka be if this is to be a successful title winning squad? It's a relative question based on everything we're speaking about. But when we consider those players, lads, McTominay, Wan Bissaka, and I'm sure there's many, many more we can add to the list, how important are they towards an overall title winning team squad availability? I don't think Juan Basaka will be at United next season. As for no. McTominay, I we've already said I've already said that I think he can have an important role in this team because I feel with Ten Hag this season he has found his role in this in this team. But Juan Basaka, I do not think I would be surprised if he was at Manchester United next season. Why is that? Why why are you so hell bent? And I'm not saying it negatively. Why do you think Wan Bissaka is going for the door? Is this something that you've heard, or is it just a, a feeling you have? I've heard a few whispers about it. I think oh, he yeah. has his mind set on a return to London. When I say return to London, it's not necessarily Palace. It might be, um, but they're they're going to see in the summer what interest is there, and I think United as well. Um, came to the conclusion probably earlier on this season that they were looking at both Dado and Wan Bissaka, and this was before Dado really kicked on. But I think they were always going to get rid of one of them and bring in a different right back, and that will definitely happen if, if Wan Bissaka is sold, which I think will be happening. I think I asked a question earlier on, right? I asked a question earlier on when we were speaking about Scott McTominay. If we felt that at a 27, if he was going to be happy with that last big contract and happy with limited playing time. Do you think that Juan Bissaka would be happy fighting for a position against a guy who is excelling in his position? I don't even think, sorry to interrupt, let Brian have a say as well, but I don't think even if Ten Hag came to Juan Bissaka so said you're going to start every week, I don't think it really changed his mind. Um, I think his head is, is, is set on returning to, to London. Yeah, I, I echo what Dale says on the fact that McTominay, we've already discussed his role and Obviously, if he's happy to do that, I can see him certainly being part of the title winning squad because I keep beating on about the whole squad factor of and the importance of it. One Baseka, like I probably would consider him part of the squad if he's happy enough to stay. But if they're saying he wants out, grand, I'm not against it. Um, 
if he's going back to London, I'd be curious what his location is because he's not going to get into a Chelsea or an Arsenal side. I don't think he gets into a Spurs side. So his level is a bit lower than that if it's not Palace for the sake of argument. I think it probably, uh, that is the most likely destination would be Palace. It wouldn't be one of the top teams. No way. He does, he's not, doesn't yeah. offer enough going forward for one of those teams to, to go from. Yeah, 100%. So, without, if we take it that one Masaka isn't leaving, could I see him being part of a successful title winning squad? Yeah, he's probably decent enough backup if Dalo was the main man. I, I wouldn't be against him being the backup, but, I think Dane said it earlier. I hope we're looking if if he's leaving and Dallo is the man to go forward. I hope we are looking at bringing in someone to take over from Dallo potentially down the line, or maybe even challenging for the spot going forward. But um, yeah, I, I, Scott definitely has a role. I'm a hundred percent adamant on that. You need them type of players in the squad if you're going to win a title. You need them kind of players. You need someone to come in. One Masaka. I never loved the fella. I won't lie. I've never loved him as a defender due to the fact that his weaknesses going forward stand against him. But he wouldn't be a bad a bad option to have off the bench or as cover by any means. But if he's heading off into the sun, fair play to me. I wish him well, did his bit with us. But I don't... Yeah, I, yeah, I could probably see him going, yeah. I probably could see him going if I'm on a sort of chair, if there is an overhaul coming in. I know this, the, the, the question was more so tailored towards certain players being in the squad. But now I'm sort of tunnel vision on Aaron Wambasaki here. We're talking about Wambasaka. We're looking at Crystal Palace as a likely avenue. Is this something that we could look at for two, what are currently 50 million rated players in Ebreche Eze and Michael Olise? There's been a lot of speculation about that. And I wonder, could that be a make way that you might see one coming one way and one going the other? There's definitely stuff with Alessia going on. Uh, meetings had def- definite interest. They haven't heard anything on Eze. But with Alessia, which you possibly worry me a little bit is the fact that he's had three hamstring in- injuries this season now from my understanding as well I believe the players side of that blame have a good reason to blame Roy Hodgson for that something to do with during the preseason tour he felt a bit of a, a strain and was asked to play that happened again during the season and when it happened he ended up pulling up with injuries and I don't think that is something he, either he, he or his people are happy with um, but I think that's one definitely to watch and as you allude to with Wan-Bissaka potentially going back to Selhurst Park United will definitely could look at not just um, Michael Alessi but uh, Mark Gay as centre back um, of course we broke the story a year ago um, that United were very interested in Mark Gay. So that is another one I would definitely think to to keep an eye on because there's one or two defenders in the Premier League, young defenders, guy at Everton as well, that are on United's radar. But Mark Gay has been on it for the best part of a year. You know, when you're speaking about Elise and that hamstring problem that he has, since June 26th of 2023, he has missed 179 days with hamstring injuries. Now that is shocking. Since June 26th, 2023, he missed 13 games in a first stage, came back, got injured again with the same injury and is now on game number seven that he's out with. 179 days. Is this really what we should be flogging our money back into with a very, very limited transfer budget as a result of all this financial fair play that we're, we're dealing with? No, I, I got, to be honest, with the with the recruitment we've had in recent years and our luck with certain players when it comes to fitness, I I don't think it's worth the risk. I think there's other players out there. And it's a shame because this is a player that I think has what it takes to play for United. I think he has that spark in games. He can ch- turn games on their head. He's a lot more prolific than than Anthony. Um, I know he's been he's the one of the headlines this weekend in a positive light, but let's see his record this season when he's been fit. If you look at his goal and assist tally, it, it's really impressive. He he makes things happen. But as you allude to Brian or Sean time and time again, the one of the most important traits in a footballer is availability. Um we've have we have far too many players that aren't available enough, so that would put me off spending big money on, on Alessi. Just another question as well, in from Mark Houston. He asks, could Mason Mount and Kabi Mano become a partnership towards the end of the season? Where do you actually see Mount fitting into the team? 
go with you first, Sean, um, on the mount part of that because we're now he's back in the team. You've been raving about him and waiting for this kind of settling period. Where is he going to play? Firstly, I think we can all raise a glass to the fact that he's back. That's uh, <laughs> that's an absolutely fantastic thing to see on top of the victory as well. I also want to touch upon one little thing before I, I speak about where he could play. That moment at the end that was captured with him embracing Anthony, I thought that was beautiful because Anthony has clearly been struggling all season with his off-the-field issues as well as his form. And you can really see that he was emotional at that point and Mount to come onto the field when he's been out for so long himself. He's only got 14, 15 minutes of game time. Didn't really impact the game in a massive way. And that's understandable in the type of game it was. But it clearly shows good character in him that he's willing to grab Anthony like that in that moment. And I think that's huge when we're speaking about the squad and going forward and having the right type of characters in the team. So that that's brilliant. To, to touch on the question, could Mount and Cobby become a partnership towards the end of the season? I don't necessarily think that that particular duo can be a partnership. And the reason I say so is I look at Kabi Menu and I see a guy that even though he can play a six, he can play an eight, he could probably play a 10 if he wanted to. I think his future in this team with this club is in an eight. I think not more so as a box to box, but as a guy who is capable of coming back and helping on defensive transitions. But I think overall, Kabi can just orchestrate the midfield and he's very, very good in going forward as we saw yesterday. Mount is more of an attacking outlet and that number eight as well, but he's also very versatile on the wing. So I think Mount is going to come in in one aspect to be able to give Bruno a night off that kind of way to, to take additional minutes off him because we have to realise as well, you have to be realistic. Mount has missed so much football that it's going to take him a while to integrate into this. And it's not necessarily the fact that he's after missing tons of football. He's missed tons of football for a brand new team, with a brand new style of play, with brand new teammates. And to have this ideal, as much as I rave about him and as much as I think he's going to be fantastic and moving forward, we have to have realistic expectations for a guy who essentially is going to be making his first team debut whenever he starts again. There, there has to be expectations about that. I think to, to, to look at a partnership of a midfield two of Kabi Menu and Mason Mount, it could work because I think Kabi is good enough to be able to sit behind Mount. And I think Mount is definitely good enough to have the technical capabilities to link in with the technical capabilities of Menu. So if push came to shove, do I think a midfield three with Kabi sitting deeper of the two, Mount in front of him and then Bruno in front of him could work? I certainly do. But at this stage of the season, with everything that's considered, I don't think that's what we're going to see in this run in toward the end of the season. Brian, yourself, when it comes to the excitement of having Kobe Maynard coming into the team, and of course, you kind of echo the, the sentiments of fans that are uncertain of what to expect from, from Mason Mount. I suppose we've seen a bit of a glimpse of what he can offer at the weekend when a lot of people referenced that Bruno was playing centre back. When he did, it was like Mason Mount was in that midfield role that is would be occupied by Bruno Fernandez. I think one of the biggest things that Mason Mount could bring us is flexibility. Now, he still has a lot to prove, but do you think that he's going to be thrown right back in after that international break? Because our midfield, you no, know, Casemiro is going to be out now for possibly we don't really know, a month or two, maybe miss the rest of the season. Do you reckon it's going to be Mason Mount that's going to get those minutes now to, to make his stint in the team? It's coming down to what way Ken Hag views Mount and what way he's going to use him because I kind of view Mount more, as as Sean said, maybe more as a Bruno replacement or an option. I don't really see Mount Menu as a centre partnership. I don't know if it works. Look, maybe it does work. If you're going to depend on Maino at 18 years of age to be your 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 anchor in the midfield and allow and Mount, who I don't view as a more defensively solid player, more I, I I like Mount as an attacking player. I think that's where his key attributes and his best football is. I'd be less inclined to partner Mount and Maino together than I would McTominay and Maino because I think it offers you more def- more cover, which I think we need because obviously we've been shitting attacks on our goal and shots on our goal so but again I, I, I suppose you know, the honest answer is I don't know because I haven't seen what Mount can do for us he's, got, he's been very unlucky hasn't had a chance to come into the side and he hasn't had a chance to show us what he's capable of so I'll reserve judgement on what kind of partnership they could be until I see it 
is the the cop out sitting on the fence sensor for all intent and purposes? It would be the same. We don't fully know how it would work, but I would be more inclined to give it a go than Cobby and Christian Eriksen because we've done that and it has its benefits that when we're in possession of the ball and how Eriksen can use the ball, I think Mount can be as good in that aspect. But I think I would much rather or trust Mason Mount more on his defensive side of the game, which isn't great, than I do with Eriksen. Because Eriksen is a real liability defensively. And he, do you know what? Even last season when he was playing well for us, he was still a liability defensively. He does not get close enough to his man. Maybe it's a matter of him not having the legs. He's not physical enough at times. But the difference is when he had his legs, it was the beauty that he provided in possession. Um, and I think Mount has that. But yeah, I'd risk it. I'd have a go. Because if you look at that game back against Everton, we had one of the best, well, apparently one of the best defensive midfielders in the world playing. And his passing was not far off Sunday league. I agree with that totally. And obviously anyone who listens to this regularly knows that I'm a big, big fan of Mount. Big fan of him. And, and I know that he can contribute tremendously to this side in moving forward. We spoke recently about five players that we would keep and build around. And Mount was one of them that I had. I know he, what he can do. And one of his biggest attributes, and I firmly believe it's why Eric Ten Hag wanted him so badly, he has an engine for days. He can run and run and run and run. And then when you add the, the technical capabilities that he has, I think it could work. It's just my only sort of reservation at this point is how much football he's missed this season and the fact that he's trying to acclimatise to a brand new team. That's when I'm really tailoring in on the question that was asked. That's where I have my reservations because this guy is going to be tremendous for this football club and I cannot wait for the moment that I can just cock my chest out when he starts doing it on a weekly basis to say, ah, there we go. That's what we were waiting for. Instantly, I'm, I'm looking forward to Mount coming in and seeing what he can bring to the side, which is a, a tad unknown because obviously he's been horrifically unlucky. But we'll move on to another question. It comes in from Keen on Twitter. And it's not a question as such, but more of a request. He asks, could we get a stat breakdown from our stat aficionado on Onana from Mr. Sean Connolly, pre and post AFCON on the pod? Now, Sean, look, to give you credit, this question came in not affording you a whole pile of time to do a lot of research and, and background on it, but give us your, your musings on Mr. Andre Onana, pre AFCON and post AFCON. Well, before I go into the stats on it, let's say confidence has really, really been to the fore with him. He looks like a confident guy. He looks a lot more like that player that we bought from Inter Milan, a player who's commanding the football, a player that is very, very confident in terms of saving, in terms of having contributions all the way across the defensive line. When you're considering metrics of the goalkeeper, obviously, like I said earlier on about the fullbacks, the role of a goalkeeper has changed so much. But if we do just focus on the goalkeeper, since he came back from AFCON, he's facing, on average... 3.68 shots per 90 minutes which is utterly horrific for Manchester United that a goalkeeper is having to face that many shots on a regular basis but then with that he ranks in the 91st percentile in the Premier League for a save percentage of 74.5% so all in all he's saving 3 and 4 of them which is very very good and when you consider it against his his, his rival goalkeepers I mean, he's ranked in the top 9% in the Premier League for it. So he is putting in a shift there tremendously. He's obviously there, thereabouts in terms of his clean sheets because when you're talking about the goalkeepers in, in, in the battle for the Golden Glove this year, David Rea and Ederson both have nine clean sheets, whereas Andre Nana is coming right up behind them with eight clean sheets in 28 matches. I mean, I can look at the stats. I can break all of these things down on a regular basis. But anybody with eyes can see that Andre Anana is facing more shots than any goalkeeper at this club should ever have to save. And when you're kind to take that and you're you're amalgamating it with a footballer who's who's new to the club, trying to learn a new lifestyle in Manchester, a new way of football that is far more advanced than what he was dealing with, he wasn't allowed an awful lot of preparation for that. Another huge part of it, and Dale actually drew on it the last time we were speaking about Anana, it was either last week or the week before, is just how much he's able to command the area 
the amount of crosses that he's facing and stopping in comparison to what David De Gea did throughout his entire career. Just since he has come back from AFCON, he's facing an average of 16 crosses per 90 minutes. And that puts him well, well up by about the 90th percentile of any goalkeeper in the Premier League. I mean, it's a huge, huge amount of work that he's having to take on board. But he is competing it because he's stopping so many of those crosses and he's claiming them so, so well. If I veer away from the stats and stop trying to bore Brian and everyone else with these metrics that can drive people nuts, you can use this thing of just watching him for 90 minutes. And you can see just how confident that he is even when he's on the football. His distribution is becoming far more profound. And not just from his foot. One thing that we grew up with, a lot of us did, myself and yourself, Brian, particularly before Dale, was we remembered a great Dane. And when he would catch a ball and he'd come and claim it, it, he was synonymous with launching it from his arm about 60, 70 yards up the field. And just that, that, that launched this really, really fast counter-attacking play. And Onana is becoming far more proficient with that. And game by game, I'm noticing that as he collects the football, when he's claiming these crosses, when he's coming out for set pieces, he's launching us forward, be it to Dallo on the right back, who was said earlier on, is collecting the ball so, so much, or whether he's bypassing the defence and launching it up into the midfield, his distribution is utterly brilliant. And we all know that that's why he was purchased initially, to to really transform this side into a forward-thinking style of team. And for me, it's night and day, really, from, from pre to post and AFCON. But I think that comes a lot with transitioning to a new league and the confidence that he's developed with stuff. So while I can't give you much more than that, Keen, if I had a few... A few hours or even if I had a day to prepare for this, I'd have something far more legible than that. I think it's uh, it's notable with how much he has improved and I think he can only continue to improve from here. Is there, any much, is there much more you can add to Andrew Onana's defence, his AFCON or has Sean absolutely nailed it? He's nailed it. Um, I'm delighted for him. I think his character is really admirable and the way he's taken some bad moments on the chin and there's nothing I like to see more than someone come out, redeem themselves. And I think he's doing that. We have somehow managed to come together after a wild night of celebrations to put together yet another show. And I believe this is 193. I mean, the figures are baffling, but we thank each and every one of you for coming and joining us every single week. And until the next time we speak, if you'd like to touch base with us, you can do so on Twitter. You can get me at Sean Connolly 85. Brian, where can they get you? What can they say? And how can they make you a happy boy? Follow me on at Day Trip and Red on Twitter. Any McTominay positivity will make me happy. And if you don't subscribe to this podcast, I'll piss in your cornflakes every morning for a week. How's that? Jesus Christ. Oh, God, I'm like, Dale, how can they get in touch with you? I think that one will actually work this week. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at O'Donnell Dale. Thanks again for listening to episode 193. 193 to represent the amount of empty cans of cider sitting in front of Brian right now. He's after demolishing an army load up during the podcast. I like to have a can when I'm having, when I'm having a chat with you lads, but... In true testament to St. Patrick's Day yesterday, when I can't honestly remember coming home and the match is a bit of a blur, so I decided to cure myself with a few cans tonight. And there's a mountain of cans of Bulmer's Irish cider from Van Mel County Tipperary, where one of our counterparts on the night here tonight is from. They're stacking up nicely. So I'm glad we're after getting through the questions and listeners. And I'm glad this podcast is coming to an end because we're getting very close to slurry and nonsense talk on my side. Are you borderline saying that you need alcohol to... Are we more bearable with alcohol? Well, mostly, mostly your pronunciation and stuff needs serious alcohol to not laugh at us. We, ha- we haven't the, touched on Mabapu yet. The Mabapu and the, the, in, the Inuasas Inuas. are great. And if Sean Connolly went any further into stats and brought up XG, I'd need a bottle of vodka. But in fairness to him, probably for my sake, he didn't. So, lads, to finish, good night. God bless. Paddy's day, we beat the shit out of the Scousers and Jürgen Klopp made a fool of himself. Fantastic. Drink responsibly. Have a mad one.